that we're about to study. We thank you for these hymns that we sang here this evening. And Lord, we thank you for the salvation and the hope that we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I thank you, Father, that uh, uh, late this afternoon that Pamela was moved from the CCU down to a regular, uh, a regular room, and I praise you. I thank you for that, Father, and I just still pray for her continued healing, Lord, and Father, why doctors don't have answers and they don't really know what to do, I know that you're the great fish physician and you can heal her, Father, and you can open up those airwaves and clear those lungs, the scar tissue, the fibrosis, just whatever is going on, you are capable, Father, of making it well. In fact, the centurion told you all you have to do is speak the word and his servant would be healed. And I believe that with Pamela, God, you just have to speak the word and it could be made well. She could be made well. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with uh, uh, <coughs> Frank and, uh, and Linda as uh, they have gone through this process of, of losing uh, a loved one. We pray uh, for Melissa Golombeski here the passing of her mother, Lord. We ask that you give the family strength, give Melissa strength, and, and help her uh, through this time, Lord. And uh, just be with the family in a special way. Be with her husband. I believe his, his name is Frank also. Uh, Lord, help them as they go through this very hard and difficult season of life. And Lord, I pray for all the folks in our church that have lost loved ones here. And uh, I pray that you would just draw close to them, strengthen them with might, and let them feel your nearness and your comfort, dear God. Father, I pray for the youth in the back, that you will speak to them in a special way, and that you'd help them to continue to grow in the things of God and to grow ever closer to you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you're an awesome and a mighty God, and nothing, nothing at all is too difficult for you. Thank you that we don't only just have a hope of heaven someday, but each day we live with the anticipation that Jesus could come again and rapture his waiting bride out of here. And so, Lord, we anticipate the soon return of Christ. In Jesus' most precious and holy name I pray. Amen. All right, so we continue our study uh, in <coughs> Ephesians. And was in Ephesians chapter one, and we're coming up for uh, one uh, the first of two uh, major prayers that are recorded by the Apostle Paul uh, in the Epistle of Ephesians. Now, uh, this is, these are prayers that even though this is what Paul prayed, we can pray the same exact thing. And I have no problem with taking these prayers and personalizing them and and praying them for our church and for our, ourselves. And so here Paul is, is praying. Uh, I titled the message, A Prayer for All Seasons. And as I gave it that, I thought to myself, well, what am I going to call the second prayer in Ephesians 3? <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. But A Prayer for All Seasons. Now, basically, you can break this down into two parts. The first part being a church-centered prayer, verses 15 through 16, and then a Christ-centered prayer, verses 17 through 29, in which case you'll see the person of Christ, the portion of Christ, the power of Christ, and the position of Christ. So let's start with a church-centered prayer, and uh, he gives us the cause of the prayer, verse number 15. There the Word of God tells us, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. This is the cause for the prayer. He heard about their faith in the Lord and their love for the saints. And those things should go hand in hand. If you're saved, you should love the brothers and the sisters. Amen. You should love one another. Uh, unfortunately, we're living in a day, and the Bible says in the last day, the love of many will wax cold. And uh, we're seeing that. We don't, there's not that love in the body of Christ that should be there. 
I was uh, talking to my sister today, and she was talking about a Baptist church uh, in the area there, and, and she had said, uh, it's great church doctrinally, Bob, but the problem is it's cold. The, the people aren't very friendly, and there's not much fellowship. I thought that was kind of sad, amen? I know our church is pretty small, but I would like to think that our church is friendly. Um, I really do. I think people do try to befriend one another. And all that begins with a genuine love for the brethren. And so his cause for the prayer, the church-centered prayer here, the cause of it is because he heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for all the saints. Now, the consistency of his prayer, this prayer for the church, is he did it all the time. He didn't just pray once. He continued to pray. So let's read verse 15 going into 16. Wherefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So there's the constancy, the continuation. He doesn't pray for them once. He doesn't just thank God for them once. He continues to thank the Lord uh, for them. And uh, uh, it's very important that we pray for one another, we lift up one another, and we pray for other churches. Amen? Not just our own church, other churches. And uh, I'll go through the different pastors that I know and praying for them and, and their church. And uh, we need to do that. I was encouraged greatly uh, by one of the things I just uh, I found out. I knew previously, but I now I found out today. I had read uh, an article and found out even more interesting information. I really believe there's a lot of reasons why, you know, Russia is going into Ukraine and doing all that they're doing. On the material, physical side of things, there's, there's no justification for what they're doing, but, you know, we, they're trying to steal resources that the Ukraine has, and it, it makes no sense in what they're doing. But when you look at spiritual warfare, and what I'm about to tell you, the whole thing is going to make sense to you on a spiritual level why this is happening. On a spiritual level, in Ukraine, out of all the European nations, Ukraine sends out the most missionaries. Amen? Now this gets even better. Uh, for Baptist churches, the number of Baptist churches, they're the country with the second most Baptist churches, America being first. Ain't that something? So now you know why the devil wants to shut down the Ukraine, amen? There's just too much going on there to hinder his kingdom. And, uh, you know, Putin, he's just a puppet. He doesn't realize it, but that's all he is. And so there's this attack. So churches like the churches in Ukraine and all around the world are churches that we need to thank God that they exist, and we need to pray for them because they all have their own individual problems and trials uh, that they're going through. And here, Paul, he's praying for these believers at Ephesus, and he ceases not to give thanks for you and making mention of you in my prayers. Now, he's going to focus on the prayer itself. This is what he's praying for them specifically, and it's a Christ-centered prayer. So there's things that Paul wanted them to know and uh, or to know more of or more about. And these are things that we need to pray for one another and ourselves and our churches also. So he says, making mention of you in my prayers, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So he's praying that they will grow in their understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ, of their understanding of God and the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He wants them to grow. He wants God to give them, give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. 
and our greatest endeavor in life is learning the Word of God, is learning to man, uh, understand uh, the Bible, understanding God through understanding His Word, and you can't separate the two. We're living in a society where, in a lot of places, the Word of God gets set aside, even in places that claim to be Bible believers. They set aside the Bible for all sorts of, of manifestations and things of that nature instead of focusing on what does God say and learning about God from what God says. And I want to tell you, these churches preaching 10 and 15 minute messages, that might be long enough to give an encouraging word to somebody, but it's not long enough if you're going to teach them about God. If you're going to learn and understand the nature of the believer's walk, it's going to take a whole lot more than 15 minutes, amen? amen. And it's going to take a lot of personal study during the week by individuals. And it's the greatest endeavor, the, the, greater, the greatest knowledge anybody can ever have is the knowledge of God. And, and people do not know enough about God. They may think that they do, and they don't. They're pretty ignorant, and God doesn't want us to be ignorant. And here he says, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. And so the knowledge of him, the person of Christ, this Christ-centered prayer, we want to grow in the knowledge of Christ. He says in verse number 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, enlightened basically being illuminated amen yeah you're in darkness and the light is turned on and then you can see everything clearly he's praying the eyes of your understanding being enlightened and illuminated and that's the primary work of the holy spirit today he was given when the word of god was was being uh written down and he was given the word of god to men he gave certain men revelation but now the key work of the Holy Spirit is to give illumination. In other words, he gives us understanding of what the Word of God says. And that's why it's always important to pray before we study and read the Word of God, asking the Lord to give us an understanding. So the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of, of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the, the saints. So verse 17 tells us that he wants us to know more about the person of Christ. Verse 18, he wants us to know more or understand about the portion of Christ. What do I mean the portion of Christ? That's the inheritance that Christ has, not our inheritance, his inheritance. Now, this is what's incredibly, uh, incredibly crazy. I, crazy is not even a good word. It's hard for us to comprehend and understand that we are his inheritance. And he rejoices about that. He's glad that his inheritance is us. We, he, we become his. We become part of his family. We're his inheritance. Now, notice what it says here, right? that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The riches of the glory of his inheritance, that's Christ's inheritance in the saints. We are his portion, and he rejoices over that. Uh, Psalms talks about giving the heathen for an inheritance, and that truly we fit that, amen? We were the heathen, and we have become the inheritance of God. And uh, he looks at us as what the riches of the glory of his inheritance. And John puts it best when he says, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he, sh he shall appear, we shall be like him. So we can't understand, how can this be a glorious inheritance for God? I mean, look at us. We're sinful human beings. We're fallen. Uh, we walk in rebellion. We don't do what God wants us to do. How, how can this be a good thing for God? 
You see, God's looking at the end game. God's looking at the full manifestation of the sons of God. And when we become like him and we have a body like his, and I mean, this, what we're looking at now, man, we, this isn't the finished product, amen? This isn't even close. The Holy Spirit indwelling us is just the down payment of what's going to come. And so we are his portion, his inheritance in the saints. Now, we go from the person of Christ, the portion of Christ, to the power of Christ, the power of Christ. Now, I may have this broken down too small, but let me give you these, these sub-points under the power of Christ, the direction of it, the dimensions of it, the demonstration of it, and the distinction of it. So let's look at verse number 19, the direction of it, the power of Christ. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe? That's the direction of the power of Christ. The direction of the power of Christ is to us word who believe. Now this is, most Christians don't, don't know this. They don't think about this. They don't meditate on this. Here is Christ's great power. He says, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe? And I believe that encompasses salvation, but it's not just salvation alone. It's God's power toward us. In fact, we have the Holy Spirit within us, so what in the world could limit us if his spirit lives within us? Amen? And so here's his power toward us. And this is the problem with the modern day church is that we have not tapped into the power of God that he has made available to us. Amen? We, we run after all these different gimmicks to try to uh, get people to come to church or make professions or make commitments when really we need the power of God. And in every revival throughout history, it's been a manifestation of the power of God. And it's just absolutely incredible. You read old re revival accounts. You have to read old revival accounts because there ain't been any new ones in quite some time. Amen? Uh, and it's amazing what God did and what he is capable of doing. But his people have got to be willing. In fact, one of the Psalms says, May thy people be willing in the day of thy power. And this is the problem. Christians will talk revival, but they don't want revival. They don't want to be willing in the day of his power. Because when you look at, at the days of revival, there ain't none of this, you know, we're in and out. No. They labored long, long, uh, six, eight hours in service and singing praises and hymns and worshiping and preaching and teaching and, and people getting saved and people being drawn into the services of God. I remember, I don't know if it, I think it was the Hebrews revival where in the power of God struck that place. There was a bunch of teenagers that were at a, a dance downtown. And when the power of God struck, boom, the dance stopped. And all those kids just left, went to the church. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible the things of the power of God. And uh, one of my favorite stories during the Welch revival, when the power of God struck and the miners begin to get saved, and it was just a move of God like you've never uh, seen before. And when it came time uh, for the miners were, were going back to work again, it was a while because the, the revival lasted and, and people, I mean, everything was stopping, amen? Bars were shutting down. Theater places were shutting down. Everything was about God. Then it came time they went back to work. And this is one of my favorite revival stories. They couldn't get the mules to move because they were used to being cussed at. So they didn't understand what the miners were saying because they weren't cussing no more, amen? And so, you know, if you're still cussing, you might want to get saved. <laughs> Uh, get revived at least, amen. But uh, but anyway, 
here it is. Uh, it's the power of God. The power of Christ. The direction of it. His power is toward us. Toward us who believe. And then the next part, the dimension of it according to the, to the working of His mighty power. So here's the dimension of it. It's the working of His mighty power. In other words, there is no limit to his, the working of His mighty power. There's no limit to it. it, it it's unlimited. It's this mighty power. And this is what Paul is praying, that they'll understand this, that they'll grasp this. And man, do we need to understand and grasp it today more than ever. So there's the direction of the power of Christ. There's the, men the dimensions of the power of Christ. There's the demonstration of the power of Christ, verse number 20, which he wrought in Christ. Now, once again, let's think. He talked about the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. He talked about the working of his mighty power. Now, notice what he says, which he wrought in Christ. He worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Amen? When he raised him from the dead. So this resurrection of power, this resurrection power that brought Jesus back to life again, it is this power, this mighty power that God wants to demonstrate and display in our life. Amen? And Paul's praying about it. They'll grasp this. They'll get a hold of it. They'll understand it. The demonstration of it. The demonstration of his power is seen in his resurrection. And nobody has ever resurrected from the dead on their own. Of course, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, and he rose again. But guess what? Lazarus also died again. But uh, Jesus is the only one to raise. He, ro he rose again by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he never died again. Amen? He raised a glorious body. He raised in a glorious body, a powerful resurrection. And this is the demonstration of God's power. How great is God's power? Well, we can look at the creation, but here he's saying, no, look at the resurrection. It has never been done before. It has never been done uh, after. Here it is, Jesus. And Jesus, just, it didn't just happen to resurrect. Jesus said he was going to resurrect before it even happened. He says, yeah, you kill this body, in three days I'm going to raise it up. And they laughed, no doubt. They laughed and they scoffed. Three, yeah, right, you know. Destroy this temple. They thought he was talking about the temple uh, on the Temple Mount. No, he was talking about the temple of his body. Destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it again. And uh, here is that resurrection power. And, and think about it, if the Shroud of Turan, if there's any truth behind it, think about how that burst of light that must have happened at that moment that Jesus resurrects from the, from the grave, because the grave clothes are still there. When he resurrects, that body goes from inside those grave clothes to outside those grave clothes. That's absolutely incredible. And there's just the cocoon of where of what was wrapped around Jesus's body powerful powerful and to leave an image on those clothes what a glorious thought this is great and mighty power so the direction of the power to us word who believe the dimensions the mighty uh, 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 working of his mighty power the demonstration of it the resurrection the distinction of it Let's look at the distinction of this power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. And where's Jesus now? He's at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He raised him to heavenly places. Now notice the distinction of God's, of Christ's power. It's far above all principality and power and might and dominion. That's all the, the, the spirit realm, whether they're good or demonic. He is far above all principalities and power because there's a breakdown in the spiritual realm. Once again, 
Most people don't understand the Bible's teaching about the divine counsel, the principalities and powers that exist in the spirit realm. They're both positive and negative. They're demonic and they're good angels. And there's the counterpart. And uh, they exist. Daniel talks about it. The, uh, the prince of, of, uh, of Grecia and the prince of Persia. And he's talking about in the, in, the, in the heavenlies, in that spiritual realm that we can't see. Now, I'm telling you that there's going to be a lot of demonic manifestation come the tribulation time. And we are already beginning to see that demonic manifestation happening now. Uh, my personal belief is that uh, UFOs and the things that people see are demonic manifestations. And uh, they're, they're real events that really happen, but they're not aliens from another planet. They are, it's demonic manifestations. And... Uh, that's going to be the greatest explanation for the rapture, I think. When the rapture happens, what happened to all these people? Well, once the demonic realm manifests itself fully, because there'll be nothing holding back the powers of darkness once the tribulation period starts. He that let us will let until he be taken out of the way. So once the Holy Spirit allows all that darkness to, to, to do their thing, and they begin to manifest themselves, They'll probably say, hey, we're from another planet, and we're here to help you. I'm not talking about Joe Biden. No, I'm talking about <laughs> aliens, amen, coming from saying not, they're not going to be really animal, an, aliens. They're going to be demonic. And what did they have to do? They had to take the Christians out because of our negative. We're too negative. We're negative energy, so we had to be removed. And people are going to believe this stuff. Right? And they're being primed for it. You look at all the latest the movies and, and everything that's going on in the media. Uh, our society is being set up for a great deception. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But uh, I didn't want to get sidetracked in all that. We needed to see that he is far above all principalities and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named not only in this world, but also in the world to come. So the distinction of the, the power of Christ is there's no match to it. He's far above. Every spiritual power you can think of, he's far above that. Every human power you can think of, he's far above that. Every name that is named. Every name that is named. All these nutcases that think they're powerful like Putin and the guy in China and the guy in North Korea and all these people, they're nothing. They're peanuts. Amen? They're nothing. God is all-powerful. God is almighty. God is on the throne. And, uh, and he's coming back. Amen? He's coming back. I, said, I saw a bumper sticker one time that says, Jesus is coming back and he's not happy. <laughs> I thought, well, yeah, it's probably so. He's sitting on the throne and he's probably not too happy. Uh, not so much what's going on in an unbelieving world, but what you've got, what's going on in the lives of people that profess to believe. So you have this Christ-centered prayer. It's the person of Christ. It's the portion of Christ. It's the power of Christ. And then the position of Christ. The position of Christ. We kind of hinted at that a little bit. Verse 22 and 23, there the Word of God says, and hath put all things under his feet. Here's the position of Christ. He's exalted high and lifted up. Everything is under him. It's under his feet. He's above it. He is over it. He's the authority. In fact, when he gives the Great Commission, he says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. All power, which the word power means all authority. Amen. All authority. And hath put all things under his feet. Amen. Under his feet. And that is exactly what has happened. Uh, I'll never forget one time early on as being a Christian, very zealous about uh, witnessing and telling people about the Lord. And I was home on leave and witnessing to my, my, my parents and uh, my dad was extremely upset with me because I wouldn't get 
my daughter Shanda baptized when I told them why. She's a baby. She doesn't understand. When she comes to faith in Jesus Christ, then she'll be baptized, and she'll be baptized by immersion, not spit on the head. That's not baptism. That's nothing. And so I said, once he can express faith in Christ, she'll get baptized the right way. And he was besides himself angry. He said, well, why? Because there's the Protestant groups out there believe that Baptism is an essential part of your salvation. Not just Protestants, but Catholics too. That's why they christen baby. Got to get rid of that original sin and all. Come on now. This is all, none of that is Bible. None of it's biblical. But people do this stuff, right? I even heard uh, uh, one fella, uh, R.C. Sproul, talking about baptizing babies. And he said, he said, well, it's all right. And, and once again, baptizing is a misnomer because they're not baptizing them. They're just wetting their head. That's it. And not even a good head washing either, just a little whatever. He said, he said what, later on when they come to faith, they don't need to be baptized because their baptism is retroactive. That's his words. I'm like, retroactive? I never heard of such a ridiculous thing. Yeah, baptism is retroactive. Once you come to Saving faith, you don't have to be baptized because you got it as a baby and it's retroactive. All right, here you go. Where? Where is it? It's not in there, amen? People are saved, get baptized. All right, so why do I bring all that up? So this is the discussion we're having and my dad is heated. And so my aunt just happens to call at that time and my aunt, said, you put your son on the phone right now. And so she's going to give me what for, you know? And so I said, yeah, I am Betty. Uh, hi, how you doing? But she wasn't doing too good. <laughs> she said, you are not a minister, and you have no authority to go in somebody's house and tell them what they're to believe. I said, I'm not going in anybody's house telling them what to believe. I'm telling them what the Bible said. It's my dad that's getting upset about it, not me. I'm just telling them what the Word of God says. That's it. Well, you have no authority. She said that overall. You have no authority. Well, I'm a new believer. I really don't know what the Scripture says completely, right? Then I come across that Jesus said, All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. And I read that and I said, Wow, praise God. I've got authority. It's from Jesus. I don't have to be a minister. I do have authority. Amen? And we have authority because he has authority and he gave it to us. Everything is under his feet. There's no power greater or higher. And so he says in verse 22, he has put all things, all things, everything, under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So who's the head of every church? Jesus Christ. Amen? Not the Pope. The Pope is not the head. The, the vicar of Christ, the substitute for Christ. There is no substitute. He is living, risen Savior, and he is still the head. And that's what it says right there. It says, uh, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. All right, so uh, over in Corinthians it says, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. And so here's all the, the, the true born-again believers. We comprise the body of Christ. All right, now this gets really cool because think about this for just a moment. If he's the head and we're the body and all things is put under his feet, then guess what? It's under our feet also. Amen under our feet also and we need to start walking in the authority that God has given us and stop backing down and being afraid of every little thing out there and compromising with the world we got to stop doing that we have a great authority the position of Christ the exalted Christ and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Man, the fullness of him, the fullness of Christ. This is, this is what the, the 
Christianity is to represent through biblical Christianity the fullness of him. That's us. That's our church. Amen? Our church is the fullness of him. And we need to express his life. And this is the problem once again. There's too many people expressing their life. Actually expressing their flesh. And we need to stop it. We need to express the life of Christ through us. The Spirit of God indwelling us, filling us, controlling us, and living through us. Amen? Living through us. We've got, we've got to get back to the basics. All right, so here is the prayer for all seasons. It's a church-centered prayer. He's giving thanks, and he is continually praying and making mention of them. It is a Christ-centered prayer um, because Paul wanted them to know more of the person of Christ, the portion of Christ, the power of Christ, <coughs> and the position of Christ. And so, what a glorious prayer. So, take this, you go home, and just pray it. Just pray it. Just start it. Verse 17, and pray it. Just pray it on through. And I've done that a lot of times. And still do. And personal, I personalize them and, and turn them around. All right, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father and God, we thank you for this time together. I pray, Lord, that uh, our prayer life would increase for all the right reasons, Father. The reasons of wanting to draw near to you, close to you. The reasons for wanting to see you work in our life. Uh, wanting to see you work in the lives of others. Wanting to see you uh, answer prayer. And, and not just these little bitty things, but major moves of God in the life of your people. Wanting to see lost souls saved, and coming under conviction through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, God, we're just continuing to pray that you would continue to move mightily and bring greater glory for yourself, to yourself, Lord. Father, thank you again for being a prayer-answering God. And thank you, Father, that you call us to prayer. You desire us to pray. Help us, Father, to learn from the men in Scripture and even women in Scripture who have prayed these great prayers that are recorded in your word. Help us to learn from these prayers how to pray ourselves. So thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.